Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation, What is Scrum? An Introduction to the Scrum Framework, brought to you by Scrum.org. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of a couple of housekeeping items. First off, I'd like to make sure you can all hear me okay, so if you would, just send me a quick update in the chat window to let me know you can hear me. Great. If you have any questions for our presenter today, please post those into the questions panel so we can get to them after the presentation. If you experience any technical difficulties, like the audio dropping out or the screen sharing not displaying properly, please post a message in the chat panel and I will work with you to resolve those issues. Lastly, on the housekeeping list, we are recording today's presentation and we'll be making it available shortly after today's event concludes. Now that we're through the housekeeping items, I'd like to introduce you to our presenter. Eric Nayberg is Vice President of Marketing and Operations at Scrum.org. Eric is co-author of UML for Database Design and UML for Mere Mortals. Eric is currently responsible for all aspects of marketing and operations for Scrum.org. Now I'd like to do a quick sound check for Eric. So Eric, if you'd like to say hello to our audience, and audience, please let me know if you can hear Eric by posting a message in the chat panel. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Great. Uh, well, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Eric to begin the presentation. Eric. Great. Thank you very much, and, and, and hi, everybody. It's always it's always weird hearing yourself introduced. Um, just uh, as, as, as you heard, I, I run marketing and operations for Scrum.org. I've, I've been in software development and software delivery uh, for more than 25 years now, helping teams and, and organizations build uh, software-based products and, and, and really helping, help, helping to put processes in place and, and so on. So uh, that's enough about me, but a little bit about Scrum.org very briefly. Our mission is about improving the profession of software delivery and really helping teams improve how they deliver software. Now, Scrum can be used more broadly than that, and, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but, but that's our main focus and where we focus. Um, something really interesting that I find is, is as surveys have been done and lots of things have happened, there's an estimate of about 90% of agile teams, which equals into the tens of millions of people every day use Scrum in some way. Uh, Scrum.org, we have over 200 trainers around the world. We've taught over 100,000 students. Uh, we're global. Uh, we've got trainers in, in almost every continent. And uh, we, we provide certification as well as training and thought leadership. A lot of new ideas, new concepts, the, the um, overlooking of Scrum itself, uh, and, and so on, come out of Scrum.org. We're founded by Ken Schwaber, the co-creator of Scrum, and, and we continue, and Ken continues to drive Scrum forward. So a little bit about what we'll hear today. Uh, why Scrum and what is it? The Scrum values, which are really, really important to upholding how teams work and work together. We'll go through the different uh, aspects of the Scrum framework, the roles, the artifacts, the events, but I also want to touch on a few other things, and then we'll have time for uh, Q&A at the end. So before that, uh, I want to just take a quick survey uh, and just understand, do you use Scrum? How do you, as, as teams, use it? So uh, real quick, if you, if you can uh, provide us with that information, that would be great. So I, when I when I talk to and work with teams, generally uh, we get a, a very wide variety of, of experience, and, and this will just help me a little bit uh, to understand that. Do we have results? Uh, we got about 81% in. We'll give a few more moments for some last-minute answers, and we'll close that up. those results. All right. There we and it looks like we have 46% uh, said yes, 19% said no, and 35% said somewhat. It's about um, uh, probably a little higher than I expected on the yes, uh, but uh, everything else pretty pretty much where, where I expected. The somewhat's always an interesting one. 
uh, because as we see, in, in, even in that 90% number, uh, people say, oh, well, we do a daily scrum, so we're doing scrum. Well, no, you're, you're not doing scrum. You're, you're doing a piece of it. Uh, that's, that, that's somewhat. So let's go back to the presentation, and uh, we'll, we'll keep going here. So that, that is helpful, though. So um, for, for those of you uh, who, who are not familiar, uh, a little bit of history. Um, where did Scrum come out of? It, it, it came out of understanding that waterfall just it was the standard, but there were issues. Gathering all the requirements up front and trying to deliver 18 to 24 months later, we were delivering the wrong things, the wrong product. And, and the wrong features to market, uh, not satisfying our, our customers. I worked on a project um, here in the U.S. with the IRS, and uh, that that project, I met with them every year. I was doing a little bit of, of, of helping and guiding with them, and I met with them every six months for about two years. And two years later, they delivered the wrong thing. They were still not complete. They were delivering the wrong features and the wrong capabilities. And, and what we found out was they gathered all of these requirements and as they went through the process of delivering on those requirements, the world had changed and they were delivering the wrong thing. So we needed to invent something different. We needed to do something different. So in, in 1995, Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland, the co-creators of Scrum, got together at Uppsala, uh, which is a conference around object orientation and presented their paper on Scrum. And talking about how do we deliver small things, small increments, in short periods of time to deliver more value. And learn from that and, and keep going. And, and what came out of that is a framework for developing and sustaining these complex products. So where does Scrum fit? If we have a very predictive process, if everything happens the same way every time, do we really need Scrum? Probably not. We don't want to be changing our process every day or every month when we're building, say, in this, in this example, an engine. But if we're building things, applications, uh, in, in, or phones, and in, in those sorts of things that have to have constant and frequent inspection and adaption, constant changing, we need to continually learn something that empirical. This is where Scrum can be very well applied in, in those complex worlds. So the Scrum comes from the body of knowledge of Scrum is written by its creators, Ken and Jeff. A new version came out uh, in November of 2017, so last year. And it's available at, oh, I thought that was on, the link was on here. It's available at um, scrumguides.org or also on scrum.org's website, uh, which links over to scrumguides.org. This is the body of knowledge of Scrum. There is only one Scrum as defined by those creators of it. And it's translated in over 40 languages as well for, for those of you who are not native English speakers. So Scrum is for complex work, not just software, um, research and identity, uh, identify markets, uh, hardware, government, uh, process, marketing uh, as well. It's all about releasing products and enhancing it um, frequently. It may be daily, it may be monthly, but it's about getting those, those frequent products to market and it's really to support the entire product through its overall life cycle. So as we're thinking about what we do and how we work, we're, we're looking at Scrum as a framework. In Scrum, you add practices to it. Scrum is not a methodology. That's a question that comes up or a comment that comes up quite often. So I use the Scrum methodology. Well, Scrum is not a methodology. A methodology tells you exactly how you're going to work, the exact process you're going to follow. It doesn't often change. Scrum is an empirical process, allowing me to consistently and continuously inspect and adapt how we work, bring on practices like XP, like test-driven development and so on, to improve my process, team by team and group by group, because my team works differently than your team. And if I try to bring in this big process, place it down and say, this is how we're all going to work, we're going to find a lot of difficulties with that. So when, when we look at Scrum, it, it really is about empiricism. It's about transparency. Everybody knows what's going on, how we're working. We have transparency into the work and into the teams. The teams are constantly inspecting and adapting, looking at how we work, how we do the things that we're doing, and we change based on that learning, based on what we know, based on what we do. So we're constantly inspecting and adapting. That, that 
term, and, and we'll talk about some some of the events shortly, but the daily scrum. The daily scrum is not a status meeting. It's about constant inspection. What are we doing? How are we doing it? And what do we need to change to get there? And that's what our entire process, that, that process that evolves out of the scrum framework provides. So scrum values, and I put this in because I feel like this is very, very important for everybody to understand. I've worked on multiple scrum teams, and when the scrum teams don't adhere to these values, we, we start to get into disarray, we start to get into disagreement, and we start to really not work together as a team. The team members need, need, need to have courage. They need to have courage to deal with the right things, the right problems, bring up activities, bring up problems, bring up issues, bring up concerns as they come up. And, and if they don't have that, and if they're not empowered, so it's also very important that they're empowered to have that courage. If they feel like executives are looking down on them and every time something comes up, they're going to get beaten down, well, you just took that courage away. Um, they need to focus on the sprint goal and the goals of that sprint and the goals of the scrum team. They need the commitment uh, at a personal level to deliver and work with the scrum team, uh, respect each member, and, and openness to share that information, whether it's with stakeholders or other team members. Um, I, I thought this was a really good little cartoon to show how, uh, how how sometimes that courage doesn't exist. Uh, as, as you can see, uh, you know, how's your project coming along? Oh, it's streaming. Uh, it's a failure. It's going to fail. Well, now all of a sudden, then that's that. Now all of a sudden, the exec comes in. Oh, how's it coming? Everything's going great. There's no courage there. We don't have the ability to inspect and adapt. We're, we're just placating management. And what happens? We don't deliver, we don't deliver, we don't deliver, we deliver the wrong things. Everybody's surprised at the end. In Scrum, there should never be a surprise. Ken always talks about the fact that um, if, if you're trying to hide things, Scrum is not a good place to be. If we're trying to hide the way we work, if, if we have a bunch of uh, holes that we're trying to plug, Scrum's going to identify those because you have that transparency. You have that constant inspection and adaption. It's all driving toward a common goal. So let's get into Scrum in the heart of Scrum. Scrum has a set of roles, the three that you see there, a set of artifacts, again, the three that you see there, and a set of events. This is Scrum. It's a simple framework. Uh, again, uh, quoting Ken, he'll say it, it's simple to understand and, and very, very difficult to master because we're constantly learning, we're constantly inspecting, we're constantly adapting. But as you can see here, it is a fairly simple framework. And this is just the view of a single sprint. So we're looking at one sprint and how does that work from sprint planning all the way through to uh, delivering it into my retrospective. So let's go through each one of those and, and starting with the roles. So there, there are three roles in Scrum, only three. We've got a product owner and there's one. We've got a Scrum master and there's one. And we've got a development team member that make up that development team. This is what makes up the scrum team. One product owner, one scrum master, and a set of development team members that deliver as a scrum team. So the product owner, their job and their role is to maximize the value of the product backlog and what they're delivering. Development team, getting things done. And the Scrum Master, making sure that the team understands how they're working, making sure the team is working well together, and in removing any impediments that the team may have. And that is the Scrum Team. Fairly simple. So a little bit deeper into the roles and looking at those. The product owner, what is the product owner's role? The product owner's role is to understand and work with different stakeholders, whether they're customers, executives, other people, internal or external customers, by the way. It doesn't always have to be an external product. Like internal customers are just as important, or users as you may call them, as external, depending on the, the product that you're building and delivering. A product owner is ultimately responsible and accountable for that product. Does that mean they work alone? No. You may have a big product. They may not be the subject matter expert in every little piece. They can work with others, but they're the ones that are ultimately responsible and accountable for that. So they may work with 
product managers who are on that scrum team or, or business analysts on that scrum team. They, they're getting their information from different stakeholders throughout the process, but they are the ultimate owner of the product backlog of what that product will be as, as, as that owner. And that's really important. Um, what we find is product by committee generally doesn't work. We need somebody who, who, who has that ultimate responsibility. And it doesn't mean that they're not working with those others. But if, if we start getting to everybody's features coming in, and my opinion and your opinion, now we get conflicting products. We get products that don't look alike. We get products that um, the, the highest priority features might be the person who yelled the loudest and not necessarily the right things for the users at the end. At the end of the day, the product owner's responsibility is to deliver value back out. Value, very important. Often I hear uh, people talk about Scrum and they talk about uh, uh, velocity and hypervelocity and delivering faster and so on. Garbage in is garbage out. If we deliver the wrong thing, it doesn't matter if I deliver the wrong thing fast or slow, it's still the wrong thing. So we need to not just focus on speed, we need to focus on quality and value in delivering the right thing. Now Scrum, because of its short increment, sprints, allows me to understand very quickly if I'm delivering the right thing or the wrong thing. But it's not just about the speed, it really is about our ability to deliver and deliver the right thing. The Scrum, the Scrum Master, they promote Scrum um, as defined in the Scrum Guide because there is only one. Scrum, one Scrum Guide. They help everybody understand it, and they also provide guidance. Think of that Scrum Master, um, you, you'll hear quite often the servant leader. They help lead the team, but they help the team lead itself. So the Scrum Master's role is not there to tell everybody what to do. It's to help everybody figure out what the right things are to do. It's to help guide that team that scrum team or as they're working to self-organize, as they're working to do the right things, to help cut any impediments if there are, are dependencies on other teams or on other parts of the organization, if things aren't working well together, help guide them. They're not the project manager. They're not the manager of the team. They're really there to help support the team and, and support that organization. It's a very, very difficult role. And then the development team, or the development team members really, because the roles are those members, each individual is on that team. They create that product increment. Uh, they, they operate in a series of sprints that I'll we'll talk about in a moment. They help organize the work, and they work with the product owner. They work with, 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 with the product owner and their stakeholders to understand and make sure they're building out the right thing. At the end of the day, they're a self-organized team that has everything that they need to deliver that product. Whether they have people from operations on that scrum team, or they can deliver and do operations themselves. But they have all of the expertise within that scrum team to be able to deliver the right product to market. The artifacts. So there, there are three artifacts for every, for, for in, in the Scrum framework. We've got a product backlog, that's where we hold the requirements for the product. This is managed as we just talked about by the product owner. We've got the sprint backlog. This is where the uh, activities that we're gonna do within the sprint are held and we pull information from that product backlog into the sprint backlog. And then we have the increment. It's potentially releasable, it doesn't say we have to release every sprint but it has to be potentially releasable. So it has to be a full working piece of product. Um, and and th that increment as well can be made up of lots of releases. We may have released every day or every hour throughout that sprint, which makes up that full increment that was delivered during that sprint. There's nowhere in Scrum that says I cannot release more than one time per sprint. I can release as often as makes sense and as allowed by the product owner. So the product backlog. Uh, so valid product backlog items may include things like feature definition, constraints, behaviors, use cases, bugs, defects, and so on, both functional as well as non-functional requirements. 
There's nowhere in Scrum that says this is how I will define the backlog items. It doesn't say I must use user stories or I must use use cases. We do what's right for the team. This is about empiricism. It's about inspecting and adapting. If the team is more comfortable with use cases, maybe we'll use use cases. Maybe we'll use a combination of things. Maybe we'll use user stories. But this is all going to depend on how we define our process within Scrum. Again, nowhere in Scrum does it say you must use story points. That is a practice that you may pull in to how you work to define that. Product backlog items, those are the, the items that of work or of potential work. They're transparent so everybody can see them. Whether it's up on a actual whiteboard, if it's stickies on a wall, or using a tool like a JIRA, for example, or, or, or a version one uh, to, to manage that content. That again is up to you, but it's a transparent product backlog and those items are transparent so everybody can see them, discuss them, and, and decide how to work on them. Uh, they must con um, contain clear acceptance criteria so that we understand, is this item actually done? How do I test this item? How do we implement this item fr from an acceptance perspective? It may reference other things like models or, or specifications and security in, in, in other areas, and they're going to be sized so that they can be completed on an estimate within a single sprint. Often we have to go through and break product backlog items down into smaller pieces to allow us to work on them more efficiently and more effectively and deliver on those items. And then the sprint backlog, that holds the work for the current sprint. Just because something is in that sprint backlog does not mean we commit to delivering it. It's a forecast. So what we bring in there is what we forecast to be able to deliver. But things change, things evolve, and we may make decisions with our product owner over that. Um, progress is, again, transparent, so that sprint backlog should be very clear and open to everybody to be able to see. Uh, it's owned by the development team. The product owner prioritizes that product backlog, and the development team pulls those items in during sprint planning to define those. And it's adapted by that team throughout as we go toward um, something we'll talk about shortly, a sprint goal. So what goes into that sprint backlog? The selected product backlog items, those PBIs. Uh, again, it's a forecast, not a commitment uh, for the development team as they're working with the product owner who has that ultimate responsibility for what's being delivered. Um, a plan often maybe includes tasks uh, that they're going to deliver, again, against that sprint goal. And at least one high priority process improvement item, and we'll talk about the retrospective in a few minutes, but th this is a really important one. This was added in the last version of the Scrum Guide. Why is this important? Why do we want to improve the team? And why do we want to put it in our product or sprint backlog? Well, if, if, as a product owner, I get focused very quickly and very easily on deliverables for my customers. What features are we going to add? Or, or you know, what, what new capabilities are we going to add? And those always end up taking the highest priority. And team improvement often gets pushed down. So in the last version of the Scrum Guide, uh, Ken and Jeff added th this element, which is at least one high priority item for process improvement should be added to the sprint backlog for every sprint. To make sure that we're constantly, as a Scrum team, improving our process, improving how we work together. And, and when this first came out, there were a lot of questions, well, wait, why, why are we getting too prescriptive? Why? Well, the reason why is if we don't do this, it gets ignored. If this gets ignored, we just threw Scrum out the door because we're not inspecting, we're not adapting, we're not learning, we're not being empirical. This is super, super important, folks. And then the increment. So what are we delivering at the end? The increment is the sum of all product backlog items for that sprint. It must be usable and it must work. It doesn't have to be released. 
but it could have been made up of multiple releases throughout that sprint as well. I worked on a, on a scrum team where we were delivering almost every day, but we we're still running two week sprints. And we'd review that increment over those two, of, of the, all of the work that was done and delivered over those two weeks. Again, nowhere in Scrum does it say we can only deliver once per sprint. You can deliver as often and as frequently as you need. And it must be done. So one of the things that's super important here in Scrum is that definition of done. Defining what, what it means for that increment to be complete. What is it gonna take for that increment to be complete? And, and it must meet all of that criteria. I just wrote an article um, that, that should be published shortly on security being a part of your definition of done. Security should be in there. If, our, if what we're delivering is great, a great set of features, but we haven't gone through our security checks, we're not done. We need to make sure everything that it that that increment needs to be deliverable to production is a part of that increment before it can be called done. And that's why that definition of done is so important. And, and we need to define that as a scrum team with buy-in from stakeholders, buy-in from our product owner. So the, oh, I apologize there, it looks like PowerPoint just crashed on me. You're actually looking at live presentations, folks. Let me uh, pause my sharing for a minute while I reopen PowerPoint. Do we have any questions so far while I'm while I'm reopening this? Uh, yeah, we do have some questions. Um, we have a question here. Uh, how can we use a project vision and a release plan to do a forecast to convince old thinkers that are asking, when am I going to get the final product and how much is that going to cost? Sure, great question. So we we absolutely do have a product vision. We absolutely do have that that vision as we're as we're building out those features that the product owner is going to uh, work with. As a matter of fact, in Nexus, which is a framework for scaling Scrum, we talk about how, how we iterate on that vision every three to three to five sprints. And, and, and the reason we do that is we, you can only forecast out so far. You also don't know exactly what is required, what is requested, what is looking to be delivered until you start delivering some things. So it gives us the ability to start to forecast that out. Um, but, but I also recommend don't forecast out too far because you know it's going to change. We've lived this day in and day out for years. There, there, there's a lot of work that's been done. Um, one of my former colleagues, Walker Rice, did a lot of work on, on forecasting. And I believe the numbers were until you get within three months of delivery, you're, you have a six-month window of when you think you're going to deliver it. And this was backed up by lots and lots of data and lots of project um, um, data that had been fed in. It's because we just don't know. There's too much unknown. So we need that vision. We need to be able to start to forecast out. But if we go out too far and we start forecasting out too far, chances are you're going to be wrong. So let's try to pull those things in. Um, I generally try to, to forecast out about three sprints which generally gives us enough information to get started and keep going. So I think my screen's back up now. Sorry about that. I'm not sure why PowerPoint just crashed on me. Um, you see my screen? Yep, sure do. Great. So the events, and this starts to get to that forecasting. Uh, so our sprint planning. Sprint planning is where we look at the product backlog and start to forecast what we can do within the sprint based on the sprint goal as defined by the scrum team. What is the goal and make sure everything is tying back to that goal. We have our daily scrum uh, where we look at progress and we'll talk through that. By the way, you notice here, it doesn't say daily stand up, it says daily scrum. This is a daily scrum. You, number one, you don't have to stand up. Maybe you decide in the meeting you do. You may have team members who can't. 
stand up. You've just offended them by calling it a daily stand up. It's a daily scrum. We've got our sprint review where we review that increment with our stakeholders. We have our retrospective where we come together as a scrum team and talk about what happened, what worked, what didn't, what things we may improve, and so on. And then this whole thing we've been talking about here is our sprint. So the sprint, it's a container for all activities and, and, and the Scrum events. Uh, as I had said earlier, that picture here, this is one sprint. We're delivering all of this within that single sprint. This, it starts with sprint planning, it ends with the retrospective, and all of those other items are contained in between. It's 30 days or less. Um, I've worked on teams that, that do one-week sprints, two-week sprints, four-week sprints, um, but generally it's within 30, well, it is 30 days or less, not generally, it is. A sprint cannot last more than 30 days. And this is important. Uh, as Ken and Jeff evolved Scrum and really start working, what they found was, and they've actually written a book on it called Software in 30 Days, once you go beyond those, that 30-day mark, you start getting feature creep. You, you start losing focus. Um, the, if you can't deliver some value within 30 days, you probably need to rethink what you're trying to deliver. doesn't mean the whole product, but some sort of value. Uh, one product trick that I worked on, one product that I worked on, um, we were had a working home page for we were doing a whole new web deployment and building it the, the goal was to build out an entirely new web platform and within that first sprint we had a working home page to that website that we were able to we didn't deploy it into production but it was it could have been and we were able to start deploying that though for for stakeholders to give us feedback so we can learn and continue to evolve that um, Ken talks in, in the book and, and, and has lots of case studies around how um, one, for example, there's a great video on our website how he was working uh, with, with Fidelity and they were trying for six months to deliver a new uh, web-based platform for trading and, and he came in and sat with them and within 30 days they had, a, they had something that was working that people were able to start to use. What happened was those six months before he joined, there was lots of going back and forth and we're going to change this, we're going to do that, we have to implement this whole big thing. Well, as they started delivering those big things, or trying to, they ran into all kinds of problems and they were delivering the wrong thing and this feedback and that feedback. Instead of just deliver something small, get feedback on it and continually improve it and continually deliver it. That's why that 30 days is so important. Sprint planning, uh, product backlog is inspected as, as defined by the product owner. Uh, we define that sprint goal. Why are we doing what we're going to do? We look at and create the sprint backlog. What is it that we're going to forecast for this sprint? The scrum team, the development team work together to deliver, to think about the how. And the entire scrum team is invited to sprint planning. The entire Scrum team is there as part of that. Uh, I just watched a video by one of our professional Scrum trainers, uh, Don McGreal, who talks about how he, he, when he runs his sprint planning, he has his, his development team members start to pull in the items from the product backlog to the sprint backlog. The reason he does that, it starts the conversations. It starts us being able to look at what is it we're going to deliver? What do we want to deliver and how? And ask the questions of the product owner and making sure that we have that done criteria for those items and so on. So this is really an opportunity for the Scrum team to come together and based on the goal, we're not pulling random things from all over the place, based on that sprint goal, what are the items we want to try to work on this sprint and forecast that we can do? The sprint goal, uh, is an objective to be met during that sprint. You've heard me talk already a lot about the sprint goal, and I think this is so important because it helps keep us focused. Uh, one of the Scrum values is focus. We need to stay focused. Um, throughout the implementation of those backlog items, um, we're, we're going to look at the objectives as they tie back to the sprint goal. Um, it allows for flexibility because um, you know, we're not going to say we're going to deliver exactly this set of features. 
because that's again a forecast, but it's tied to the goal that we were going to deliver capabilities for users to do X, or we're going to deliver a working home page, those sorts of things. Um, and it's fixed throughout the sprint. We're not changing our sprint goal every day. Um, we're looking at how do we work to achieve that sprint goal. If we change it every day, it wasn't really a sprint goal. It means we're deviating from that sprint goal and we're not really focused. Again, losing that focus. The daily scrum, it's an opportunity for the team not to do a project status. This is not a status meeting. It's an opportunity to continually inspect and adapt based on our targeted sprint goal. Are we moving toward that goal? Do we need to replan? What are the things that we need to work on to achieve that? Do we need help? Now, don't wait either. One of the biggest mistakes I see are people waiting until the next daily scrum to bring up an issue. Bring it up when it's when it's urgent. Don't wait. If, if something happens an hour after the, after the daily scrum, don't wait another 23 hours to bring up that issue. Let's bring it up now. But this is the opportunity for the team to get together, the team to discuss, and, and constantly inspect and adapt. It's time boxed at 15 minutes. If we can't have this happen within 15 minutes, then we're probably doing too much. We're probably trying to attack too much. Keep it focused as well. One of the things I do on my scrum team is uh, we, we'll, we'll do post scrums. So if we're going too deep into an item, some may call it a rabbit hole or a rat hole, um, we'll say, let's pull it back. The whole team doesn't necessarily even need to be involved. Let's post scrum on that and let's keep going through um, and really inspecting what we're working on, um, how our team is working, and are there things that we need to change. So why do we have the daily scrum? We, we share those, those commitments as a team. Um, we identify any impediments that might be getting in the way. Our Scrum Master may, may help us here. It helps us create focus uh, and, and certainly increase and maintain awareness as a team. Here's an example of, uh, of, of a daily scrum. So the sprint review, uh, the, that increment is inspected with the stakeholders, whether they're customers, marketing, sales, executives, whomever. They should be invited to that sprint review to give us feedback. You don't see the word demo here. The sprint review is not a demo. You do demonstrate how the product works and you demonstrate that product, but, but it's not just a demo. When, 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 I, when I hear the word demo and think demo, I feel one-way communication. Here's all the stuff we did this sprint. Thanks, uh, thanks for watching. And it becomes a sales process. I'm going to sell you on and why everything we just did was great. Versus a review where the development team is sitting with the stakeholders whether virtually or in person, and really reviewing the work that's happened. Helping to get feedback so that as we go into sprint planning for the next sprint, we're able to take that feedback and adapt how we work, adapt product backlog items and so on. Getting that information is so critical because if we're not delivering value, if we're just delivering, I'll say inside out, if we're delivering what we want, but the customer, the user doesn't want it, are we really delivering value? Versus outside in, getting that feedback and almost instant feedback, right, 30 days or less. Now I know that I'm delivering what is expected. I'm, I'm getting feedback on that delivery and helping to deliver the right thing. So some mechanics for the sprint review. Um, the product owner shares what was done, what wasn't done, um, where we are with the backlog. Again, transparency here. It's ultimate transparency. A development team shares the actual increment that, that work, what happened during the sprint, how they dealt with issues, I mean, everybody provides feedback. It's not an excuse for self-congratulation. It's about inspection and adaption, providing that feedback. Now, granted, congratulations, good job is good. We want that feedback too. We want happy teams. But it's not about selling, and, and I think that's what that means there is we're not there to sell all of our stakeholders on why they, why they want this. It's about communication and, and, and absolutely positively a two-way communication. The sprint retrospective. At this point, it's just the scrum team members. We don't have anybody from outside the scrum team here because we need to feel protected. We need to feel that this is a safe place 
for us as a scrum team to talk about what worked, what didn't work, what do we need to improve, what got in the way of us working together as a team. And, and this is a really important meeting or event, and, and I find it to be one of the most valuable ones. Because it really is about inspecting how we work as a team and adapting as we move forward. Working together to do that. And, and this is where the scrum values start to really come in. I'm, they, they come in throughout, but the scrum values are so important. We need to respect everybody in this meeting. We need to have the openness in this meeting. We need to be able to have those conversations, those hard conversations, those critical, crucial conversations as a team to keep working and keep working in the right ways. So just to give you some ideas, and, and this is at, right out of the Scrum Guide, um, each event, and if we're doing, say, a 30-day sprint, a three-week sprint, a two-week sprint, a one-week sprint, about how long those um, how long those meetings should last. And this is a time box. It's interesting. In the last version of the Scrum Guide, uh, Ken and Jeff had to add something defining the, the time box, saying no more than. Um, to me, that's the definition of a time box, but it came up in questions all of the time. So it doesn't mean you have to fill eight hours just because it says sprint planning for 30 days takes eight hours. If you can do it in four, do it in four. Don't find excuses to make it eight. Just try to time or do time boxes no more than eight hours. If you think of it that way. Now, same thing with the daily scrum. Now, the daily scrum is time box no matter how long the sprint is at 15 minutes. But if today we can finish it in 10, don't find excuses to talk just to talk. At its meeting, that's when people start to actually lose the value that they're getting out of the meeting. By, by keeping focused, we actually get a lot more value as a team, and, and we stop going through the motions and actually start interacting together. So a few other items I wanted to cover, product backlog refinement. Um, what does refinement mean? Now, some of you who are, um, I know there was, uh, I think 30% or so of you who said you, you already do Scrum. Um, you may have, have heard the word grooming. Um, grooming was changed to refinement uh, due to its meaning in certain languages. So uh, product back, backlog refinement, it's an optional practice, but we talk about it a lot in Scrum. Uh, in, in actually, in, in the scaling framework Nexus, uh, it, it becomes a primary event because it, it becomes more and more important as we scale Scrum from one team to multiple teams working together. And, and product backlog refinement is our opportunity to discuss the items in the current product backlog, understand what those are, work with the product owner as they're prioritizing those items, but also breaking down items. Something may be a very, very large item. Can we refine that down into a set of items that allow us to work on it more easily when we get to sprint planning? That allow us to break that up so we can deliver a piece of that functionality, for example. Maybe I have this enormous user story, which really, um, in, in terms, could be an epic, broken into lots and lots of user stories. Let's do that. So we can focus in on delivering the right things. And, and that's the product backlog we find it. And lastly, the definition of done. I talked a bit about this earlier. It's that common denominator of quality for the product. It, with that definition of done helps us all agree on what it means to have a done item what it means it needs to be to be considered done, releasable product increments. That definition of done is transparent across the team. So we're not having different definitions of done across the team. Every, every item needs the same definition of done so we can share that responsibility as we're getting to release. So in, in summary, Scrum implements empiricism, and, and you know, we've, I've focused a lot today in software development or software delivery, um, and, and the empiricism is so critical here. It's about constantly changing, evolving our process, pulling in the right practices, 
We announced a few weeks ago uh, Scrum with Kanban, for example, where Scrum teams, where it makes sense, can pull in certain practices from Kanban to build out and define their overall process based on that Scrum framework, not changing Scrum, but adding practices, just like we've done by adding XP practices, by adding test-driven development practices, by adding user story practices as an example. Those are all practices that pile on top of Scrum to help me define my process. But it's about that empiricism. It's about constantly evolving to make sure we're delivering the right thing. Every Scrum role, there are three of them, has clear accountability. Uh, there are three Scrum artifacts. Those artifacts are and need to be transparent. And all of those events help me inspect, adapt, and evolve via transparency. If I don't have these things, I am not doing Scrum. I may say I'm doing Scrum, but if, I'm, if I don't have these things, if we're not constantly inspecting and adapting, we're not really doing Scrum. Unless you've got it perfect. If you've got it perfect, you know, let me know, because I'd love to come work for you. So with that, um, I'll open up to uh, questions. Okay, great. Um, we have a lot of questions here, um, maybe more than we can get to, but we'll try to go through them. I'm sure. um, have one question. Uh, so the scrum roles that you had uh, mentioned do not include the manager role, uh, which can cause some confusion in scrum adoption in many companies. Um, so what's your take on that um, and how would you address that? Sure, so managers still exist in, in our organizations. Um, and they do, but the manager is not a role within Scrum. I don't need a manager to be able to deliver a product. Um, that manager generally will be a stakeholder to the Scrum team and work with the Scrum team as a stakeholder, but they're not a part of the Scrum team unless they are, are also on that development team. Um, and there may be people who have the title of manager, but we need to also be able to, to, to flatten that out a little bit. But there, so in, in, in scrum teams that I've worked on, there have always been managers above that scrum team that do the HR functions, that help manage um, team members fr fr from day to day and so on. But at, at the scrum team level, we need to be able to self-organize how we work, what we do, and, and when we do it. Um, the, the minute you start getting command and control of a manager tells everybody what to do, we've just lost empiricism. We've just lost the ability to inspect and adapt on a daily basis to continue to work. It doesn't mean throw them out. It doesn't mean throw out all of your managers. Managers are important for many, many reasons within an organization. As a matter of fact, we've got a course you can see there um, on, on the lower right, um, PAL-E, uh, Professional Agile Leadership Essentials. That's a great course. Uh, where managers learn their role in helping the, the scrum teams be successful. And managers play a great role in helping those teams be successful, but it doesn't mean they have to be on the scrum team itself. Okay. Um, how much should the scrum master help the product owner? Uh, an example given was ticket refinement. So that, that's really going to depend team by team. There, there's not a clear answer. Um, it depends on the team, and, and the team's going to learn, and, and that may evolve and change over time. Product owner is still going to be ultimately responsible for it. What you need to be very careful of is making the scrum master into the meeting planner and scribe. Uh, they may do that, but that's not their job. Their, their, their job is not to be the person who just you know, schedules all of the, the events and takes notes at the event. Um, but they are a scrum team member, and they may work with that product owner to, to help where needed, but there's no hard and fast, oh, 10%, 20%. It's going to depend on how that scrum team's working, um, how they're formed. They may find that the scrum master is doing too much work with the product owner in, in really doing the product owner's role. Now we have a different issue that needs to come up during the daily scrum or needs to come up during um, during the retrospective where we need to figure out how do we address that. 
if we if we have an absentee product owner, now we've got a different issue, and maybe we need a new product owner. Okay. Great. Um, is the Scrum Master part of the development team, or is their role solely as the Scrum Master? So the, their role, the Scrum Master's role is as the Scrum Master. They're part of the Scrum team, not a part of the development team. And, and there's important reasons for this, that the product owner is not part of the development team, the Scrum Master is not part of the development team. And um, there, there's a good video um, that uh, Evelyn Roos just recorded on why this um, makes sense, and, and it's posted up on our website. Uh, the minute the Scrum Master or the product owner are also responsible for delivery on the development team, there's a conflict of interest. So um, I'll pick on the product owner first. If the product owner is also uh, on the development team, guess what's going to get worked on? And guess what's going to take priority? The things that they want to do, which makes sense to a point, but don't always, uh, because it needs to be a team effort and, and, a, and a team think. Same thing with the Scrum Master. Well, I'm going to make sure everybody takes care of my impediments first, or that maybe there's a something that I think is highest priority, but the team doesn't agree. Guess what I'm going to work on? The, the, you start to get that conflict of interest. The minute the person who's supposed to be supporting the team and helping to mentor the team and, and coach the team and deal with impediments and so on is also just a, a part of the team that's delivering. So keeping those roles separate are really important. Evelyn's got a couple of great examples in her video. You can check them out or uh, shoot me an email and I, I can point you to them. Yeah. Um, besides the uh, latest Scrum Handbook, uh, what would you suggest for um, people new to Scrum, uh, what kind of resources would you suggest for getting the best handle on Scrum? Sure. So um, to get started, I, I'd go to the, the scrum.org website. Um, if you go under resources, you'll, you'll see right under what is Scrum, under resources. And, and there's a whole number of resources around, um, including videos, books, blog posts, and, and so on, and, and including around each role, each event. Uh, in each artifact that, that help you learn. So uh, the scrum.org website is, is a vast knowledge of Scrum. Uh, when I talked about who we are and what we do, yes, we do training, yes, we do certification, but a large number of the people who come to our website are coming to learn and learn direct, directly off of that. Uh, we also have a forum where you can, um, you, you can ask questions, and we've got um, Scrum experts who are answering those questions um, from all around the globe with their experiences. There's a lot of resources, videos, webcasts like this one, um, uh, white papers and so on all there, and as well as a list of, of recommended books. Um, Software in 30 Days is a great book by Ken and Jeff. Um, Ken's first Scrum book, uh, Enterprise Scrum, uh, another great one that, that really will help uh, people understand how you apply Scrum within a real organization. Great. Um, what are the biggest challenges you've seen on teams implementing Scrum, and what are some ways uh, to overcome those? That's a, that's a pretty broad question. Um, so a couple of things that, that I've seen that kind of stand out. Uh, one is where the Scrum team isn't truly left independent. Uh, they're a Scrum team by name, yet there's managers in there every day telling them what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. Um, that's where you need a really strong scrum master who, who has the power and the ability to push back and, and really protect. And one of the scrum master's roles is protecting the scrum team and protecting its independence. Um, the minute we start to get into command and control, we, we lose that. That's probably the, one of the biggest failures that, that I've seen. Another is going through the motions. Um, e either you're doing Scrum or you're not. Um, you know, take those roles seriously. Take the offense seriously. Take the artifact seriously. Um, we're either doing Scrum, we're either following the Scrum Guide or we're not. And, and I don't mean that from a religious perspective of do Scrum or don't do Scrum. I, you know, pulling those other, other um, 
practices, pull in the things that you need to be successful, but don't deviate from the scrum guide either. Don't don't say, oh well, you know, we're instead of doing a daily scrum, we're going to do it weekly. Well, and, and and I've seen this, and I've had conversations with folks who try that, and guess what? It really becomes a status meeting, and they're not constantly inspecting and adapting. They're not learning. They're off doing their own thing, and then they come back together and give status on their own thing. They're they're not doing scrum um, as it's meant to be done. Next question. Uh, yeah, we have someone here who says they feel that uh, people keep mixing up Scrum and Agile and wonders uh, if you can define the difference between the two. So Agile is a mindset. Um, there are lots of ways to be Agile. Um, agile is absolutely all about inspection and adaption, um, but Scrum is a way to be Agile. It's the most popular Agile framework. Um, based on survey data that I've seen from lots of different uh, resources. Um, but Scrum is just one of the many ways I can be agile. Um, agility itself is about le constantly learning, inspecting, constantly changing how we work, adapting. Um, and, and what Scrum does is give us a way to do that. hope that helps. Um, if uh, if a team executes a sprint um, of three weeks, for example, uh, could they next sprint change the time length, say, to four weeks? They absolutely can. There's nothing in the Scrum Guide that says uh, you must always do the same sprint length. Um, but what I recommend is don't jump all over the place. Don't do two weeks, four weeks, two weeks, three weeks. Right? Try to keep it at a steady pace. Um, that said, I've worked on scrum teams where, um, for example, our normal cadence was always two weeks. But there were a couple of things we really wanted to focus on and deliver very quickly. Um, and so when we set a sprint goal, we, we, we shortened our sprint to one week. Um, and we only did that um, for, 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 for one sprint or might have been for two sprints. Um, and we set a very um, specific sprint goal for that sprint. Uh, and what that allowed us to do is, is get really, really intense focus uh, on on that sprint goal for that sprint. Um, it, it helped us do some different things. But what I what I don't recommend. So what I recommend is that you try to t stick to a consistent sprint length. Um, if you do need to change, don't change all the time. Um, people, in general, people are, are creatures of habit. And if we start jumping all over the place, we're going to lose focus. We're going to be disruptive. Um, and we'll find ourselves less effective instead of more. Any okay. Uh, yeah, when managing multiple projects, uh, would you consider having a single scrum for the projects or keep them separate per project? So um, um, uh, it's a hard one because everybody defines project as something different. So I don't know what what this person means by project. What I would look at it is you want a scrum team or you want a, you want a set of scrum teams per product um, and a single product owner for that product. And you may scale that to multiple scrum teams. So again if you check out our website um, and, and under resources you see scaling scrum with Nexus. And the Nexus framework that Ken created helps define that better. Um, in, in that framework, what we focus on here is how multiple teams can work together to deliver an integrated increment within a sprint. So rather than having one scrum team off doing their thing and another off doing their thing, the scrum teams are working together, delivering that integrated increment. Uh, they may have one scrum master, they may have multiple scrum masters, but they only have one product owner because they're delivering on a single product. Um, so I generally try to break it down by product, uh, and that's how scrum breaks it down. And um, so project, I, I'm not sure because I'm not sure of the full context, but I hope that helps. Okay, um, we're close to the top of the hour here. We still have um, time here for a couple more questions, if that works for you, Eric. Yep, absolutely. 
Okay. Um, what advice would you give um, about working with Scrum uh, and remote team participants? Sure. So I've, I've got a great example of that. Uh, my last Scrum team that, that I was working on, actually my current Scrum team as well, um, we have remote participants. A couple of things, uh, make sure your, your product backlog and your sprint backlog are transparent. Use a tool. Don't throw it all up on a whiteboard that nobody can see. Um, use video for your um, for your events so that you're all able to see each other because expressions are just as important as the words, sometimes more. Um, so make sure you're using video, whether it's something like um, Hangouts or Skype or, or go to a webinar like we're using today, that you're all working together. Um, make sure you're always and this is actually in the Scrum Guide as well, and we talk a little bit about it. Your daily Scrum should always happen at the same time every day uh, to make sure that we're all um, on that same time zone. If you can stay within a small number of time zone, that's more helpful, but not always possible. Uh, but but that's certainly helpful. But really communication, um, using some sort of instant messaging as well as using the, the video is key. As a matter of fact, on... Um, my current Scrum team, we, we we have a video up all the time where we can always walk in and chat. Um, people are always on it communicating. So we're even though we're virtual, we're working as as a team and really acting as a team. I think we probably have time for maybe one more. Okay. Um, does it make sense to have the sprint review with only the dev team and product owner participating? So get your stakeholders there. If, if you're not reviewing your stakeholders, um, there, there's a term I use, but I'm not going to. Um, you're, you're, you're preaching to yourselves. You're not getting the feedback. Get stakeholders involved um, as best you can. Now, your stakeholder may only be your product owner. If that's the case, that's okay. If you can start to get some of the other stakeholders involved, so one of my scrum teams, for example, uh, I was the product owner. I always invited my, my CEO. To our, to, and we were a small, small organization, but I always invited my CEO because, because he was a key stakeholder uh, to every sprint review. Um, I always invited our marketing team to every sprint review and so on because they were stakeholders in what we were delivering. So try to get some of that feedback. Um, what you want to be careful of in, in that instance, um, do you have to have the stakeholders there? No, as long as your product owners are representing the stakeholders. But if that's the case, you have to be very careful that you're not <laughs> that you're not feeding back feedback that's just inside the team. Make sure you're thinking outside and broader from the team. So um, I think we're at time. So I, I, again, I apologize for that little blip um, in PowerPoint. Not sure what happened there or why PowerPoint just decided to crash, but it did. Uh, so I want to thank you and uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, my email address is eric.naiburg, uh, N-A-I-B-U-R-G, at scrum.org, or you can find me uh, on Twitter at at eNaiburg. Again, thank you, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Great. Thanks very much, Eric, for a great presentation today. Uh, I'd also like to thank today's sponsor, scrum.org, for providing the DZone audience with a wonderful webinar presentation. And lastly, thank you to everyone who joined us today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.